Hi class. Okay, so we're in the uh, third module and the first um, subject that I'd like to talk about, which is of course quite relevant to um, business ethics, is going to be moral responsibility. How can we hold someone responsible for the moral choices that they're making and what are the parameters around that? So I think the first thing we've got to kind of lay the groundwork for that subject. So let's talk about what a business is to begin with. <clears throat> Legally, it's an entity that can hold liability for the actions of the business. It's an entity that uh, can be identified in many different ways and therefore also held responsible for its choices. But ultimately, the choices of a business are the choices of the people who run the business, the decision makers. They are ultimately the people responsible for what is going on. And we can see that by the legislation that started to come out in the uh, late 1990s and in the early 2000s, the government and the lawmakers began to understand that this was the only way to properly make sure that companies ran according to the laws and in an ethical way. After all of the scandals with Enron and uh, Bernie Madoff and all of the other stories that are out there, they realize that the companies are not insular entities behind which people can hide, but that in reality, the companies are simply the reflection of the will of the people managing them. So hopefully the people that are managing the companies are what you and I would call rational individuals, rational people. That means that they're making decisions for the benefit of the shareholders and the employees and the customers um, in the choices they make in the business. <clears throat> so what is a, a rational person? Since we've just explained that a business is essentially a group of rational people making decisions together, what is a rational person? So a rational person we understand to be a person who uses the observable information and facts which they have access to. Keep in mind, of course, we don't always have access to all the facts, but to the facts that we do have access to. And based on an evaluation of those facts and based on a clear definition of the goal of the company, of the business, um, all the rational people who manage it come to a conclusion that is in the interest of that uh, goal. That's a rational person. Somebody who manages a business and tries to harm the customers or harm the employees is not acting in the best interests of the business. Now that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen but I want you to understand what the model is and then we can take a look at how these things deviate because of course they deviate and our goal as ethical managers when we walk in is to try to center the company and the, and the management there to follow that ethical path because it will ultimately the, be the best thing for the company and ultimately be the best thing for each of them. So, we've already defined what morality is um, in business. We have explained that ethics is the examination of these moral standards that we have chosen to live by. And so, as a manager, now that we've understood what a business is, and now we understand what a rational manager is, so what is 
the moral responsibility that I bring or you bring to the table when you're managing? Well, there are two preconditions that are going to be required in order for you to be held morally responsible for the decisions that you make. First of all, you need to know what is morally right and what is morally wrong. If the choices you're making do not include your observation of the moral right or wrong, then I don't know how you can be held responsible. Now, how do you have to know what's morally right or wrong? So that is a great question, and it demands that a company get together with the executives and the employees and map out the moral, ethical, virtual, uh, virtue compass that the company will operate from. What will happen if there is sexual harassment? What will happen if there is discrimination? What are the guidelines for people's conduct? And you can be as specific as you want. You can have guidelines for um, the manner of speech. You can have guidelines for dress. You ha can have guidelines for um, the, the, um, the recording of activities. As long as everything is transparent and nothing is hidden, you are giving the opportunity to the employees or the customers to be able to make a choice whether, given the guidelines that you have, they want to do business with you or they want to stay working for you. So knowing what is morally right or wrong is not simply, well, I live in a society, so I know, you know, we don't kill people. But, um, you know, we can steal depending, or the most famous line is, well, you know, it's relative. Relative means it's non-existent because it's always dependent on what works best for you. So knowing what is morally right or wrong demands a conversation in the organization where a clarity is attached to all of the potential issues that can occur. The second aspect that um, is required in order for you to be held morally responsible is your ability to effect a change to the situation. Now the landscape of that change is pretty wide. So at a very narrow perspective, you may be the actual decision maker who can um, either change what's going on or allow what's going on. For example, if you're uh, pouring uh, effluence from a factory into the um, into trenches in the back of the building, and that uh, pollution is then flowing down the trench and into the backyards of people that are living there, um, you know you can very easily have the manager of that division go out and tell people to stop doing that or turn off the spouts find a different way to get rid of the, this garbage now you as an employee in that company may not be able to turn off the the spouts you may not be able to uh, change what they do with the effluence but you may have a voice that allows you to say this is the wrong thing to do so the landscape um, of what you can do is pretty wide and you have to understand that um, unless you have the ability to do that um, you can't be held morally responsible now to give you an example of how that wouldn't work is let's say you don't live you don't work in the plant and you don't live in the neighborhood but you heard about the fact that this company may or may not be, you know, um, letting their effluence flow into the back of their plant. But you've never seen it. So you can't come along 
and say, well, I know that that's what they're doing. Because you need to have documentation, you need to have evidence, you need to have the ability to make your claim valid. And when we talk about whistleblowers, you know, that information will will come out in that um, in that discussion. So, as we're saying, in order for you to be held morally responsible, it's necessary for you to know what is morally right or wrong, because it has been defined, hopefully by the organization. And secondly, you have to be someone who has the ability to affect a change in the situation that we're talking about. And of course, you know it to be true. Um, in much of the discussion that we see in the literature for business ethics, the theme that seems to be recurring in terms of a mission statement for companies, and you'll see it in your textbook, is the idea that moral responsibility of a rational person at the least is to do no harm. Now doing no harm is something that will mitigate your um, moral responsibility. And remember that the challenge will always come to you when you're accused of doing something inappropriate. So in order to mitigate that, what, the, what business ethics is suggesting is that if you have a philosophy of doing no harm, every time you're faced with a situation, you will think about it from that perspective. And I'll give you a, an interesting case that I happen to have been involved in that sort of addresses that issue. A building that I was involved with, um, but did not own, um, was approached by Rogers uh, and asked uh, if they uh, would be willing to put the cell towers on top of the building in order to transmit the cell phone um, uh, signals. In exchange, uh, once the towers went up, Rogers would pay the uh, ownership of the building uh, $1,500 a month as a rental fee. So, on the surface, that seemed like a pretty reasonable deal. You put these towers on your building, it doesn't take anything away from the rentable space, and you're good to go. If you were thinking about to do no harm, the very next thing that you would think about is, what about my customers? What about my employees? And what about the environment around me? And so your customers would obviously be the other tenants in the building. One of the tenants in this building happened to be a preschool. The, the building was bordering on a neighborhood. So it was uh, private residences. What happened was that once the towers went up, the parents of the children that were going to the preschool went ballistic. They felt that these towers were sort of like a magnet for all of these radio waves and that their children that were going to the school were being inundated with these radio waves and could cause nobody knows what kind of untold damage. Second, the people who lived around the building and now saw these towers had exactly the same complaint that now these, um, these towers were going to be acting like a magnet to draw all of these radio signals into the area passing through their homes and uh, basically cooking everybody as um, as they pass through. Now neither of the two complaints are valid according to the science. But those were the complaints. The parents in the preschool basically told the owner of the preschool that if these towers were not taken down they would remove their kids. 
Now the preschool uh, was paying rent uh, to the owners of the building in the neighborhood of about $10,000 a month. And keep in mind, Rogers was giving them $1,500 a month. Um, the people who uh, owned the homes were getting pre uh, ready to file a, uh, a lawsuit against the owners of the building because they felt that um, this should have been um, publicly debated and they should have had a voice. Now, forgetting for a moment uh, whether you uh, want to know how the case turned out, the point is you're going to be paying lawyers at least uh, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars to fight that type of case, and uh, and the school moving out would take away about a hundred and twenty thousand dollars of revenue um, against the fifteen hundred that you were getting paid from Rogers. So that is a pretty devastating set of circumstances to end up on your desk Monday morning after the towers went up. Could this have been mitigated? Well, an ethically responsible manager would have thought about the implications of every decision that they are making in terms of their customers, i.e. the tenants in the building, or the natural environment around them, the people who live in the neighborhood. And it doesn't make a difference if it's a property and radio waves or if it's a factory and it's effluence and pollution. You still have a community of people around you. You still have employees that work for you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that's why it's so important to have that default thought in your mind. I don't want to do any harm. And of course, the critical thing to doing no harm is to be transparent. You may recall that from the core values, uh, the moral standards that we spoke about. Transparency in every situation removes the difficulties and the attacks that you're going to face. So to conclude um, this portion, moral responsibility demands that you are a rational person making decisions for your organization or business and that this rational person knows what is morally right or wrong and is able to affect a change or an influence on the decisions that are being made and that at the very least you will try to do no harm.